This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have a special guest, Scott H. Miller. Uh, Scott is a life fellow of the American Numismatic Society. He's a very active volunteer here. He comes in uh, sometimes weekly, if not uh, a little bit more often. Is an expert in the medallic arts, uh, notably those of the United States, France, and really anywhere in the Western world. Uh, he is the author of this book here, uh, which is the uh, medallic art of the American Numismatic Society, published by the ANS in 2015. He is the author of numerous articles, uh, the most recent one uh, in the first issue of the 2021 issue of the ANS magazine called Medals of the Colombian Anacreontic Society. Uh, he was a speaker at the most recent Coinage of the Americas conference held by the ANS in September of this past year, uh, which was on Victor David Brenner. Uh, this talk on that was largely uh, was on the largely unknown sculptures in the round of Brenner, uh, and he was also integral in the planning and uh, leading up to the conference. Today, he will be presenting the function and design of metals. Uh, just so everyone is aware, this long table is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube, uh, hopefully within the week. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Scott H. Miller. Okay, well, thank you, Jesse. Um, I would start off by saying that this uh, presentation actually started as something given to art students. Uh, it's been cut down a bit and modified for the audience. Uh, but most talks on metals generally talk about the general history and collectability of metals. And this is going to look a little bit more at, at their function and design and how that has changed over the years. Uh, we can start our slides here. Okay, that's our topic. And our first slide after that. Thanks. Uh, we can, so we're actually starting in reverse order here a little bit with the contemporary metal, this by Jal Duarte. Um, and for most people, especially myself, this really epitomizes the modern metal. And to really think about metal design today, we have to envision this rather than, than what we normally think of as metals. And I think the best place to start a little bit is in a little booklet that came from uh, the an, an exhibition at the ANS in 1989 uh, by John Cook on the metal as art, and it related to the fifth anniversary of his uh, workshops at Penn State. And in this booklet, he does mention how metals had pretty much died out and. Uh, gone to the wayside in the last 50 years, but with the modern metal, there was something of a revival. And in many respects, that's true. Uh, the period post-World War II saw a big decline in the use of the metal and, as well, and the designing of metals, largely because modern sculptors at that point really had a hard time adjusting the new art styles to the metal. Uh, and fortunately, things are changing a bit, not always to our taste, but that's you know neither here nor there. Uh, so look, this one, I remember when I first saw this and I kept thinking these are really toys and nothing else. But after looking at them for a while, you do realize that there is merit to a good number of them. And it's one of those things that I think time will just sort of help old people like me. Um, as George is probably chuckling at the moment. Uh, if we can get to our next slide. So now we can go back to where we should be and the, the origins of metals. And the metal as we know it, that is say the portrait metal started during the Italian Renaissance. And they came about largely because of the renewed interest in ancient Rome and other civilizations. A lot of things were being excavated and people saw some of the Roman, ancient Roman medallions, uh, some sculpture, and they realized that this is a, there was a permanence to this much more than anything else. And there was a way that fame and 
individuality could last much longer than paper or any any um, other form painting and so on. So if we get to the next slide. The first medal to come about, and we're not quite sure how or why, but he did it, was designed by uh, a well-known painter of the period, Antonio uh, de Puccio Pisano, known as Pisanello. Um, and if we can go to the next. And this is the first medal that he created. And we should realize it was not the first bas relief or uh, medallic like item uh, of the period, but it, it's the first where we have a round uh, metal. This was cast bronze, as all were at the time, and it had an obverse, it had a reverse. The two sides work together in a unified theme, and that's what really defined the metal for a very long time. Uh, there were some religious bar reliefs, there were a few portrait reliefs, and other things, but this was what the first of what we actually recognize as the medal. And it's from the visit of John VIII Palaeologus. Uh, he had come, he was the uh, next to last Byzantine emperor. He had come to Italy, hoping to unite the two churches, the Eastern and the Western churches, and to gain support for his throne, which was tottering to say the least. But here we can see, uh, portrait one side and then here he is on the reverse um, looking at a cross and it's probably taken from a hunt scene but this was the first one and followed by a lot of others next so we're going to look at two more uh, pieces by Pisanello and this is how the metal developed again cast bronze here's one of Domenico Malatesta, 1444, uh, cast bronze with a portrait on one side and on the reverse, there is a scene of him uh, kneeling in armor before a crucifix and his horse to the side and related to a, a vow that he'd made that if he were successful in a battle that he would dedicate a hospital. And uh, again, two sides telling a single story uh, presenting just one single idea. We can get to the next slide. Uh, the third of uh, Pisanello that we're going to show is one of Cecilia Gonzaga uh, from 1447. Um, following that same sort of idea of having a cast metal with a portrait, uh, we have uh, the obvious portrait and Cecilia Gonzaga was going to be married in an arranged marriage by her father to somebody that was considered uh, unacceptable to her. He was something of a brute. He had a very poor reputation. And she was something of a scholar and did not want to leave uh, the ability to pursue that. So she entered a convent and the reverse design here reflects that where you see her sitting uh, with a unicorn by her side. And as we all know, the unicorn can only be tamed by the vir a virgin. So this relates to her uh, chastity and her innocence at this period. Uh, next. One of the problems that we have with metals from this period is that they were very successful. People loved metals but they were limited to a certain elite, princes, nobles. Uh, they, they were issued basically for their fame, for their uh, position. And over the years, this slowly began to change. Um, here we have one, a typical mid 17th century Dutch piece. Uh, and we're still talking about civic leaders here. Uh, Admiral Trump, uh, was killed in battle in 1653. Uh, but what we see here is a good example as to how uh, in time, the medals refl reflected the art of the period. This is very much in the Dutch period of, uh, of the time, similar to many paintings, but the method of production is very different than you saw in the Renaissance. 
This is not a cast metal, so to speak, but two cast shells that were joined together. Uh, would have been cheaper, possibly um, a little easier in some respects. And it was a style of production that did not last all that long, but had um, its counterpart uh, for several centuries. So as I said, these were two shells that were cast and joined together. In the early 1800s, we saw something very similar, those struck shells with uh, Thomas Jefferson Indian Peace Medal. And then again, uh, in the mid 19th century, electrotypes began to be used. The largest proponent of that as a means of creating individual new metals was probably Carl Muller, who was working in New York in the mid 19th century. Um, but his, in, in his case, it was two electrotypes that were joined filled with lead and allowed you to make a very large metal. At uh, this period, you really could not strike very large metals. So this was one alternative. There were a lot of struck metals being made, mostly smaller ones. And as I said, the success is what led to the downfall of the cast metal because if you want to make a large number of metals, it's easier and cheaper to do a lot of very small ones, which could be struck. But what that did was change the person producing or designing the metal from the artist to the craftsman. Artists, a skilled sculptor was not generally going to engrave the die. And unfortunately, that is what happened uh, shortly after the Renaissance started, the metal started. So if we can get to the next. Probably the best known series of this period, and we do have a lot of series of metals, uh, is under Louis XIV. Louis XIV, the Sun King, was one of the great opponents of the use of metals for propaganda purposes. And to that end, he created a small group of people at uh, the Petite Academy whose function it was, among other things, to create metals. So the group would decide what aspect of his reign was important enough for him to have a medal to commemorate. Somebody would come up with the inscriptions. Another person would come up with the design. Somebody would actually execute this thing. Everybody then has to go back and sign off on it. And while this led to a great propaganda movement, it led to a certain lack of artistic style. So that any one of these looks really nice. But looking at a couple of hundred of them laid out in front of you, you see it gets boring very quickly. Now, at this point, uh, metals uh, were used for propaganda, but they were also something that was not really uh, envisioned initially, where uh, in 1500, the local noble might have a metal made, give it out to a few of his supporters, and it was not only a way of preserving your own identity and importance, but also the person receiving it felt very important. Here, it was pure propaganda that these were used as diplomatic gifts, but also they were available for collectors. And at this point in the 18th century, uh, a lot of collecting was done by nobles, people who not no longer limited to rulers, but just people who were well off. Uh, you've all heard about people uh, going on the grand tour as part of their education, and they would fill up their baggage with paintings and statues. Well, they also collected medals. Some coins do, but the medals are the important part. So a lot of these went and were available to purchase by uh, these well-off folks who were on their tour. Uh, one of the great references to look at for this is the Duke of Northumberland sale, which was sold uh, by Sotheby's 1980, 1981, because it was an intact collection of medals that were accumulated by the Duke and du first Duke and Duchess of Northumberland in the 18th century. And most of the medals were the Duchess's collection. And again, you the, there are hundreds and hundreds of these. 300, over 300 were sold as a single lot. There were that many. 
but um, get to the next slide. The idea of the medalist propaganda was not limited to Louis the 14th. It continued under Louis the 15th. Uh, the English had their own series uh, under Queen Anne and then George the first to some extent. But the per next person who really took the medalist propaganda was Napoleon. And just like Louis, he had a long series. Like Louis, there are uh, standardized as to size, format, design, and so on. And uh, it was probably like, like the last time that it was used quite to this extent as propaganda. Uh, next slide. Now, I mentioned that uh, the, the um, people creating metals had changed. They were no longer artists and sculptors, but were craftsmen. Uh, there were still a few artists who were making metals. Uh, cast metals are still being made in Italy, especially. But occasionally, the person who really was the craftsman was so exceptional that he or she, and in this case, it was virtually always a he, could rise to the level of a true artist. And possibly the two best, at least uh, in Britain, were Thomas Simon and William Wyan. Uh, William Wine was very proud to, to uh, show the RA initials after his name. Uh, the one on the left is by Simon and was from the coronation of Charles II in 1661 after the restoration. And this thing is pretty small. And you can see down there you know, the, just the, the amazing quality of engraving. That is a really good portrait of Charles seated in that chair. And the William Wyan piece here is from 1837 and uh, was issued by the City of London to commemorate the visit of Queen Victoria to the Guildhall in that year. Uh, that portrait of Victoria was, uh, was so well liked that it was the basis for the postage stamps, the very first ones, the penny black and then uh, blue and red after that. That's about all I know about stamps. Next. <laughs> The 18th century saw a number of series of medals other than the ones that were used for propaganda by, uh, by Louis in France. Medals were used as commemoratives, they were used for political purposes, but there were also these huge series of medals. And again, it was this a symbolic of the degradation of the quality of the artwork. Individually, these are actually fairly decent. Uh, the one on the left is from the Kings and Queens series. Uh, these are both uh, dossier. Dossiers were a family originally from Switzerland of medalists. And all of the Kings and Queens had the monarch on one side and generally the tomb on the reverse. The one for Oliver Cromwell, not being king, just a wannabe had a medal that was a little, just a little bit smaller than the true kings and queens. And again, individually, it's fine. But looking at a box full, it's, there is a certain lack of imagination in them. Then we get to the Great Men series here. We have Edmund Halley. Uh, there are others. And it's always the portrait on one side and then an inscription with the same uh, ornamental border. Can get to the next slide after that. And here we have probably the low point of art uh, and not even going into the later Franklin Mint stuff. Uh, but in the early 1800s, uh, there was a long series of illustrious men in France. And again, hundreds where you have a competent but not very inspiring portrait on one side and then you have uh, an inscription indicating who it is and maybe one or two words about accomplishments. But it was something that could easily be bought by uh, somebody you know, working on his library because these are important things for people to have. Uh, the true gentleman needs to have these collections, but there was not much thought either in artwork, production, or anything else. It was just easily done. Uh, 
just checking time here. Okay, not too bad. Next. Now, one of the things about the metal, we noticed that in what John Cook said, in that when it hits a low point, something happens that sort of brings it about. There have been this number of revivals in metal over the years. And this is one of the great ones in that it was the reintroduction throughout Europe of the cast metal. And in the early beginning of the early 1800s, uh, Pierre-Jean David, who was better known as David Danger, a name that he took to avoid being confused with uh, that other painter named David, uh, besides his statues and other work, created this long series of contemporaries which were generally uniface uh, cast portrait medals. And this one here is the French uh, chemist Chevreau, uh, <clears throat> who actually, I believe there were two medals of him over the years. Um, but it was something that took off. It was not limited only to France. If we can get to the next slide here. So, Throughout Europe and the US, there are a lot of people who were influenced by this. <clears throat> France was taking over uh, from Italy as the place to go to learn the new arts in the uh, third quarter of the 18th century, of the 19th century, rather, sorry. And these are two of the best of that period uh, of the Americans who went, Owen Levi Warner with his uh, portrait plaque of Chief Joseph, and then a victory head by Augustus St. Gaudens. Again, these are large uniface cast medals or plaques. Uh, Chief Joseph is actually about 18 inches across. So probably a little bigger than your average medal. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> there was also a movement in Britain on the new cast medal. Uh, something which is generally overlooked, but not only was there a resurgence in the last quarter of the 19th century, but surprisingly, most of the people making metal, these cast metals were women. And that's because there was uh, some classes taught at the Slade School of Art by the French-born artist Alph Alphonse Le Gros. And there were a large number of women who took this metal making class and they began to turn out a, a large number of mostly portrait medals, cast and bronze, and sort of dominated that particular aspect of metal making in Britain up until uh, World War II. This particular one is from uh, Theodora Gleeson, whose father, Count Gleeson, was also an artist, but she took uh, instruction not only from her father, but also at the Slade School. And because all of these women studied at the same school in the same class, they very early on uh, were known as the Slade Girls. Uh, next slide. Now we get to, as a lot of you know, my favorite period. And that's the turn of the century, uh, century circa 1900. Uh, Art Nouveau, though most of them are actually Beaux-Arts style. And it was a reintrodu reintroduction of the art metal, but with a number of differences. The first is that the reason a lot of this took place was because of the introduction of the Janvier reducing machine, which completely changed how metals could be made. Uh, it was no longer a large cast metal. It was no longer a small struck metal that was that had to be engraved by the dying engraver, who was a craftsman rather than an artist. The new machinery allowed an artist to create a metal, uh, large relief in plaster or some other material, and that by mechanical means could be reduced and converted into a die. At the same time, there were a lot of changes going on uh, in, in the West about collecting, and uh, people in general where people had more money, people were better educated. And instead of the wealthy being the collectors, and there were a lot of wealthy, they still did uh, collect, but it was something that was 
almost expected of the middle class as well. Uh, this is a time when children were collecting scraps. The famous scrapbooks were actually uh, little chromolithographic advertising pieces that they put it, saved and put into books. Uh, they collected rocks, minerals, um, tobacco cards. Middle class people were collecting coins, medals, stamps, prints, posters, all of these things. He had a lot of societies that were uh, issuing them, especially in France, where you had uh, groups issuing a series of prints uh, that were eagerly sought and collected. This piece, by the way, is by Roti, and it is for the fr first French art metal society. If you can get to the next slide. Uh, we also have a certain popularization of the metal. This is from the 1900 Paris Exposition uh, by Chaplin. Uh, compare the Im images here to the um, picture of the exposition itself. And by the way, the Eiffel Tower was from 1889, not 1900. It was just still there as it is today. But metals were used for a lot of other popular purposes. They were increasingly used as prize metals. They were uh, corporate metals. So the new technology also made this much easier, more readily available for uh, the um, so like companies and the less than wealthy people to have access to. If we can go to the next slide. We also have a certain democratization of the portrait metal. So whereas during the Renaissance, they said the noble, the local ruler is going to have a medal issued and given out to a few close people so that his own esteem is enhanced and preserved for posterity. The people who received it uh, felt that they were fairly important because they were close to the inner circle. Late 1800s, Metal, portrait medals were no longer that exclusive group. It was available to middle class, upper middle class, so that you have people like here, this uh, Charles Rossino by Roti is an architect, uh, very common for architects, doctors, lawyers, all to have a medal or plaque made, very often on a retirement or a significant birthday. Uh, Adrian Newell, while not poor, that's by the way, Mrs. Newell of uh, Newell of the ANS, uh, well, not poor, certainly not of the princely status, and an early ANS medal here by Brenner uh, of Muhlenberg from St. Luke's Hospital. Not again, the person you would expect in, to be shown on medal in, during the Renaissance, but very much the type of person you would expect in 1900. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. I mentioned that people in the middle class began collecting metals, and it was a fairly common thing uh, for the for art metal societies to spring up. This one is from the Fr French uh, Art Metal Society by Alessandre Charpentier, and as you see, the the theme of the metal here is nothing but. Uh, some, but work everyday workmen, you know, skilled uh, workmen, without doubt, uh, stonemasons, and uh, <clears throat> but not the kind of person that you would ever have seen in centuries before. It was, you know, again, also reflective of other aspects of art where the common man was uh, illustrated in sculpture and painting and so on. Next. Uh, this is from the Dutch Art Metal Society, uh, Dutch Belgian Society, rather, by Chris van der Hoff, who was one of the, or probably the great uh, designer from the Netherlands, um, very much in the Art Nouveau style. Some of his later work uh, incorporated Art Deco, which, you know, not all that common for sculptors to go from style to style, keeping up with modern trends. Next. Uh, there were certain schools that were specific to countries or the way that uh, metalists sort of approached metal, making metals. And World War I was something of a last hurrah when 
Medals were used throughout uh, the European countries that were involved. And looking at them, you can get some sort of perspective as to how people not only viewed the, the war, but also what sort of art was popular during those periods. Uh, one of the things that I would like to mention, that's why I have this one here, is that we normally think of art styles during the, their heyday, when they were at their peak. So we think of Art Deco as mid-1920s, and we'll get to the, that in a minute. But you can see here this from a decade earlier, where the beginnings of Art Deco are popping up. It's not something that just immediately began in 1925. But you see the um, geometric shapes here on the reverse and a little bit on the obverse as well. So if we get to the next, uh, next slide, uh, during World War I, in most respects, France, somewhat Austria, and certainly Belgium in many respects, people thought of war in sentimental terms. War was not something terrible and horrible, and uh, but rather something that, again, the, the sentiments that you have, uh, obviously some soldier has, or family member has died during the war, and you just have the kneeling figure in sorrow over it, classically draped almost with flowers. Nothing very shocking here. Uh, and by the way, Schraub is a French medalist. Next. Lusitania was a specific event that had lots and lots of medals and other imagery as well. So to some extent, we can think of the image on the right is very similar to some things that we see, but the sinking, the drowning woman with the baby in her arms among the fishes is, a, it's, we're now not quite so sentimental. We're starting to understand this can hit home a little bit. Uh, figure on the left, uh, Edith Cavill, one of two nurses uh, who are, murdered or executed by the Germans, depends on how you sort of look at things and which side you're on. She was helping uh, soldiers escape captivity, but here, she, uh, while she was executed by firing squad, I believe, this case is just a soldier coming up and shooting her point blank. Uh, and then at the bottom, even more in your face, you know, death holding the skull going before death. This is really um, and in your face, a rather uh, horrible idea or view that of just how bad war and death and destruction is. So let's look at a few of these medals. Next. Uh, so here we have a French medal, 1918, a little bit after the uh, sinking of the Lusitania, uh, also obviously for the American involvement. But the Lusitania is pretty much straightforward. There's nothing particularly shocking or brutal about it, except the little girl at top who was drowning. Not quite as nice and friendly as some other images. And then here we see uh, Statue of Liberty now prepared for war with the sword. Um, I'm not sure if that's sinking or what, but certainly in the waves. Next slide. The German approach was not quite so pleasant. This medal uh, was by the satirical medalist Carl Goetz. And if you see the date, it's May 5th, 1915. This is pretty crucial. Actually, that was actually a mistake. Uh, the sinking was May 7th. But the Germans, to some extent, knew what they were doing. Uh, they had put notice in the papers for people not to buy tickets and not sell on Lusitania, that to travel on Cunard. And here we have uh, the ticket office with the uh, figure of death as a skeleton selling tickets to the would-be passengers. And then on the reverse, the sinking ship with the date May 5th. This was taken as proof by uh, some in Britain that it was premeditated. Germans were specifically looking for the Lusitania and knew they were going to sink it well in advance. So many, many uh, cast iron copies were made and sold for charitable purposes in Britain. There were also a few uh, small number that were made in the US for similar purposes. Next slide. 
Here we have uh, Eberbach's view on the same. Uh, he created a series of um, medals called the Dance of Death, uh, all featuring skeletons. And here we have the figure of skeleton uh, of death as a skeleton over the sinking Lusitania. This is a cast metal. Uh, most of these were in iron, though sometimes the series can be found in bronze. Uh, and the next slide. Uh, Ludwig Gies, uh, Sinking of Lusitania, uh, cast metal. And one of the uh, hallmarks of Gies' work is that individuals are pretty much reduced to uh, just small little worker ants, insignificant in and of themselves. Uh, and a whole series of medals all showing the same thing. Now, these were all done for propaganda purposes. And there was an early exhibit at the um, British Museum on these with a small catalog by Hill. And they were available for purchase uh, outside of their country, mostly through Shulman's in the Netherlands. The Netherlands was a, a neutral country during World War I. And it's that neutrality that later caused the rift in the Dutch-Belgian Art Metal Society. So they split into two. But when these were made, they all knew that they would be available to belligerent and neutral countries through the Dutch. Uh, if we get to the next slide. The, uh, after the war, a lot of countries began issuing medals to commemorate what had just transpired. This is from the uh, Belgian society uh, by Wiesard. And again, the Belgians look upon it in a less horrific manner for the most part. So there is nothing really you'd want to turn your head at. The, the worst thing that we see here is a couple of uh, holes uh, from cannon probably in the stone wall. Next. So in France, uh, and then other countries, we have the beginnings of Art Deco. Uh, again, metals are now, they are still keeping up with the current art movements, but they're no longer necessarily in the fine arts as much as the decorative arts. Art Deco was largely uh, something in the decorative arts uh, as opposed to you don't really see Cubist paintings, but you do see Art Deco paintings. I mean, not paintings, uh, medals. Uh, so, the, so here we have one by Pierre Turin, one of the great French uh, medalists, with a very classical image, but with very Deco imagery. Uh, next. Also from the French Art Metal Society, uh, another uh, also cast bronze by Demain, a little bit more. Uh, cutting edge as far as metals go for the period, uh, still keeping the two sides working together. And if you notice at this point, there are still two sides. We don't have three or four yet. Uh, but this is music and dance, which go hand in hand in life, and they go hand in hand here in the metal world as well. Um, then uh, we also showed the uh, use of uh, the archaic uh, Greek, archaic uh, ancient figures, which is something that is used in this country as well, most notably by Paul Manship. And we'll see one in just a moment. Next. I think this is the last of the French ones that I have. Uh, uh, Vernon's Medal for the inauguration of the great ocean line of the Normandy in 1935. Uh, again, Art Deco of the period, uh, classical images, but with the modern take. Uh, there is the woman who is harnessing the energy of transportation there. And the ship, which is the Art Deco style, Normandy was noted for that. Um, the, if we can get to the next slide. And then we get to the United States, perhaps finally. Uh, here we have one of Lincoln by Brenner. This uh, was an image that he did, we say 1907, 08 here. 1907 was the large cast. This is the struck one, which was at the end of 1908 for sale in 1909, before somebody jumps on me. Uh, but 
while the portrait medal was something that was available to the middle classes in Europe as well as the U.S. at this point, we were also we in this country. We also began thinking of now in terms of the common man, if you will. And Brenner was very not Brenner, Lincoln was very much that. Lincoln was the classic American story of uh, somebody who raised himself up from his bootstraps. And in, in creating this matter, Brenner was sort of following the contemporary ideas of the period. You can get to the next medal here. Uh, this one, uh, we have Weinman's uh, Saltus Medal. And again, one thing to re that I want to mention was that even though the, a lot of these medals were trained in France, when they got to the United States, as seen by the Lincoln, the medalists began to apply that, but using American values. Um, this is just actually one of my favorite medals I had to show it. Uh, next. Uh, so here we have the 1930s classic art deco period. The Society of Medals was the second of the art medal societies in the US. The Circle of Friends uh, being fairly short lived was the first. And again, using contemporary styles, contemporary ideas, two sided, but using this for a single image. Paul Manship's uh, Dionysus. Was some it was slightly satirical because the United States was still in the middle of, of prohibition at the period, and uh, we also have the um, archaic imagery on the back there. And um, again, this is a middle class collecting sort of idea. Metals, in many respects, were were still following that earlier trend. Something that was very much done for the middle class coll collector. The next slide. This is Lee Laurie's uh, Society of Medalist piece, um, Whatsoever Man Soweth, issued uh, at the very beginning of the Dust Bowl period. Uh, I don't think he necessarily had that in mind, but also uh, the Art Deco style that Laurie was known for. And Laurie is probably best known for his work in Rockefeller Center at 30 Rock. There's this wonderful building relief he did of wisdom, uh, which is man holding um, a compass. Uh, next. And DeFrancisi, uh, beginning to, if you notice here, still Art Deco, but beginning to use the shape of the metal as part of the design. It's not just a round piece anymore, but you can do more. It's not round, not square. The shape is part of the creation imagery. Uh, the, the next slide. And finally, Sterling Calder. And we are now, even though it's 1938, uh, the, the deco was no longer necessarily the uh, predominant uh, art style, uh, certainly not in decorative arts, and he, he's moving away from that. Calder, by the way, is the father of uh, uh, caller of the stable and mobile thing. Next. So then we get to sort of the contemporary metal. And in recent years, things have changed. So here we have a very much classical uh, metal with an obverse and a reverse. There is a uh, very obvious design. The, it's not round, but what really sets this apart are two things. One, the two sides are not only unified in idea, but the two sides actually interact with each other. It also stands up. So this is a metal, but it's also a very small standing sculpture. And it's sort of the beginning of changing the idea of what is a metal. Uh, in many respects, the idea of a metal has changed in the last uh, few decades. Uh, used to, the Society of Metals at one time, and we need to change, I know there's an extra L there, used to use the motto that it's sculpture you can hold in your hand. But that's in recent years has become, if it's sculpture you can hold in your hand, it's a metal. And to some extent, taking time, ah, getting on. That is something that John Cook mentioned 
that it's in almost whatever. Um, next. Another modern, this from British Art Metal Society, I'm trying to go real quick, we're getting late, uh, where again, you, you have more than two sides. It's a very traditional metal in how it's executed, but the shape becomes part of the metal, giving the image of Lord Nelson next. And here the shape has gone very far to the extreme where it is barely recognizable as metal, but clearly is one at least from the shape. Uh, next. And like we have this just like for the <clears throat> show, like you know, the Renaissance, the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and the modern metal here, which has changed completely uh, in terms of format and uh, has really gone beyond what we traditionally think of as metal. Um, I, th I think maybe we should go for questions now, Jesse. I was going to use this to show the, how the old is new. Uh, this was a um, an anamorph anamorphic mirror, a late 18th century device. Next slide. Which is apparently getting a small revival. And we wouldn't mind seeing this on a metal where you have some small, seemingly abstract sculpture, but when you look at a different angle, you see something else. Uh, next. Okay, I've spoken too long, babbled, but if we have any questions, I see one in the chat. Wow. Yeah, Scott, <laughs> thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank Peter Van Alphen, uh, chief character of the ANS. Uh, a lot of what you just saw is a condensed version of a PowerPoint that he made for uh, our graduate summer seminar, the Eric P. Newman graduate uh, summer seminar um, on medallic arts. Uh, Scott and I kind of ripped it apart, made it smaller and, and added some things. So Peter, thank you uh, for helping out, even if it was unintentional. Uh, so yeah, with uh, if there are any other questions or any questions rather, uh, you can read from the, uh, from the chat over here. Um, uh, and, and if there's anyone who wants to just kind of start talking with Scott, that's yeah. all. Hey, so. I'm, uh, okay, well, I see there's one here on allegorical figures. Uh, so I should probably do it. And then we'll get to you, if that's okay. Uh, Ms. McClellan? Oh, uh, Is, is okay. that okay if I just, because I, I saw one here. Uh, okay. Can you comment on the use of allegorical figures on French and American medals late 1800s to pre-World War II? Uh, in general, there was a there was a use of allegorical figures, but they had changed a great deal. So that in the 18th century and early 19th century, allegorical figures were used in the classical sense. Uh, it was meant for educated people, and very often you had a book that will tell you what these things are. You know, Louis XIV published a book on his medals. It, it helped a lot. Uh, but a lot of figures had very specific figures uh, that would indicate who they were and what they were. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, I think the use of allegorical, allegorical figures in that regard has changed a lot, partly because people are not as classically trained. And it's something that has, uh, today we occasionally even see where uh, not long ago, there was uh, a U.S. Mint medal with an allegorical figure, but the uh, device that the figure was holding was for a different goddess. So it, it, it wasn't used to quite the same purpose. We would have things like, it was very common to see agriculture, but agriculture would, would have something where there would be some produce nearby. Whereas if it was in 1800, there would be a specific uh, figure representing uh, an ancient god or goddess. So it was, I would say it became much more generic in terms of the allegory. Um, okay, uh, Ms. McClellan. Oh, hey, uh, yeah. thank you very much. A fantastic talk and I've learned a lot and just beautiful pieces of, of art. And I love the way in which you showed the, the progression and interaction with uh, contemporary art styles. I just like a small comment about 
17th and 18th century French medals and your point about uh, artists versus engravers. I take some, some issue with that in the sense that, you know, there was a special mint exclusively uh, for the production of metals and uh, jetons. And the, there was an, an engraving staff there, but many of these were also royal engravers and they were officially members of the Academy of Painting and Sculpture. And some of these works were exhibited at the various salons uh, throughout the course of, of, the, of, of the 18th century. So uh, it just that distinction between you know, artists per se and engravers per se, I think is, it needs to be sort of melded a little more for well, that particular period. I, I wouldn't mind I mean, if I had more time. These are like gross generalities because I would not be one to say that Dupre was not an artist. I would not say that Nini's work does not rise as being art, real artwork. But again, just in, here's the history of, of Western art in, in a half hour. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just trying to give a few generalities, but, uh, but I do agree with you that there were still artists who were capable and did do some medals, especially the larger cast ones. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Mel Wax. Uh, Scott, what is your opinion on the future of art medals in America? Where do you think that's going? I think that we will have art medals as we traditionally know them. Uh, but I think the real future is with some things that are being put out uh, by the contemporary artists who are going into areas that we don't really think of as traditional medals. Um, not something I'm necessarily as comfortable with just from my collecting tastes, but there is some good work being done. And I think we, you know, time will tell, but I would not dismiss all of the uh, Amson Fidem medalists. Uh, some of them do do very good work. I have another question from uh, Norma. How does PowerCoin play into this? Uh... I'm sorry. Norma, if you'd like to elaborate at all on your question. Uh... PowerCoin, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, uh, yes, hi, this is Norma. Um, it's a company in Italy and they, I don't know if I can cut and paste a picture into this chat. Is that possible? Maybe not. Um, they, there's all kind of, they're not really coins, they're metals and they, they do a lot of what you're talking about. And uh, well, I've bought some of them. Uh, they're very beautiful, but I just was curious about it. Is there a way to put a picture in in this chat? Austin? I don't think so, Jesse. Uh, I'm not 100 sure. Either. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could put a link. I know the I, the company's website. I have here. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do yeah. that, maybe. Yeah, I just I put that in there, and I you can see a number of the examples. Um, yeah. yeah, and they're yeah. doing a lot of that three-dimensional stuff that you're talking about and uh, unround shapes. In this particular picture, it looks like they're all round, but they're, they're doing a lot of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's series and uh, NUIE, something like that, uh, New Zealand. It's just, it's interesting. I would, uh, I'd love to know your view of it, but it sounds like you haven't seen their stuff. No, um, if you ever go on, to, are you a member of uh, MCA, um, Dallas Collectors of America? No. Dallas Collectors of America, oh, because there is a, uh, a monthly uh, Zoom meeting where that might have been a good place to talk about this. Oh, okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Um, but sorry, I, I just don't know that group. It's okay. And. Yes, and Joanne, what about uh, the horse in that early metal? People thought of things differently and had different viewpoints back then as to what was acceptable and what wasn't. What can I say? <laughs> a question um, from uh, Mike Markowitz. In recent years, there have been a great proliferation of collectible uh, military challenge coins. How do these fit into the history of medallic art? Well, they will be a part of medallic art. There is a range in quality. I... They're, they're certainly not sculptural, uh, but one of the tendencies of 
medals today is to go in one group is going from sculpture to graphics and then having a computer take over. But I've gotten a few of those. I would, in some respects, they've taken over the distribution of medals from the Renaissance period when if a prince gave you a medal, it was something that you would show and you'd be proud of because you were associated with that prince or that local ruler. And I can tell you that in government offices, uh, a lot of people like to display the challenge coins that they receive over the years. Uh, the ones that I received, I generally threw in my desk, but I know people did it did do that and there was a lot of demand for small little metal stands so people can put that in a bookcase or on their desk so i think in that regard it does have a history a place in the history of medallic art but i'm not quite sure in terms of like the sculptural point of view it, it's something else and i think we maybe have to wait a little bit to see where that leads especially as some things are only available as an award, but a lot of others can be purchased from organizations. Uh, can you say a little bit about the Padawans of the 16th century? Uh, not too much. I'm not very big on, uh, on studying the, uh, the medals of that period. So I think I, I would rather somebody like Stephen Scher or somebody address that, to be honest. Uh, we, here we have a comment from George Kuhay. Near the end, you had a uh, Jean Stephen Solomon medal from the Feedom delegation as a tulip in the shape of Holland uh, as the yes. Congress was at the Hague. It's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But again, it was the use of changing the shape so it's no longer round, which is why I threw that in. Um, I think that that might, we have lots of uh, comments and praise for Scott's presentation. I don't see necessarily any more questions per se, but if there's anyone uh, who wants I to- I see do... Donald. I hear from Donald Scarinzi here. It is good to hear from you. Hope everything is well. Um, yes, there's... by all means. <laughs> Excellent, excellent, I'd love to see an excellent. Uh, I wouldn't have missed this for the world, and uh, I'm glad uh, it was it was as outstanding as always. Um, you know, Scott is my teacher, and uh, I've learned a lot from Scott, and uh, you know about metals. And I tend to gravitate towards contemporary art metals, and I have a somewhat uh, somewhat interesting collection of those. Um, and I just received my. Uh, FEDEM conference medal today. Um, this is called uh, this is called uh, Save Our Planet. Uh, it's done from uh, it's done it's made by a, a, a Japanese artist, a Japanese American artist living in Brooklyn, and it kind of shows you, you know, it kind of shows you what's going on in contemporary medallic art. You know the the they've. Some people like Dick Johnson used to call these art objects, right, as opposed to uh, metals. And there's always been, a, you know, up until recently, uh, a, a very heated debate about what is a metal, right? And uh, um, I think it's now resolved. And uh, these, uh, you know, contemporary approaches to metallic art, um, you know, are more cast as opposed to struck, although you know, um, you know, struck metals are still uh, are still actively used uh, for in large degree to the, for the same purpose they were used um, uh, throughout history as awards, as commemorations, um, you know, or as just purely artistic statements. So it's, it's very interesting how the art of the metal evolved in the United States. It was slow to. Uh, join the rest of the world. It didn't really happen until 1984 to 1986. Um, um, you know, as, as uh, I see George Kuhaj is on this call as well, uh, who could also uh, tell you a lot about contemporary mm -hmm. art. So I enjoyed the presentation, Scott, as always. Thank you. And I'll ask you, knowing me as long as you have, did you ever think you would hear me say uh, so many positive things about Duarte? <laughs> Did, did you did you had to see me smile? I, I <laughs> <laughs> Joe Duarte 
it, the Portuguese art medal um, is is very much a you know a functional object, and you and if you have an opportunity, the ANS has a has a lot of Duarte's uh, medals. Uh, you know, I think Peter Peter has a a place in his heart for for Duarte. Uh, as I I'm glad you use I'm glad to hear you, Scott. I mean. It's, <laughs> I guess I have, I have a quick kind of, maybe uh, maybe it's not so quick, almost a philosophical question sort of about um, your uh, thoughts on it. The metal and kind of numismatics as art um, and the immense conservatism, I guess, that plays out. I mean, I guess that's, that's why a metal kind of becomes what it is. It's something to convey, whether it's commemoration or kind of celebration um, of a moment or a person or some broader scenario, but I guess, is that perhaps what's going on with the, maybe the tension with maybe this sort of the sculptural contemporary medallic artist that's breaking out of something that's so deeply, uh, that's been repeated for a very long time as a, as a form? Well, coin, coins themselves are generally conservative by nature. Uh, they, the, the designs tend to last a long time they are national symbols, and most countries want something stable rather than fleeting. Uh, but, and because so many of the people that make metals are the ones who make coins in terms of design, there is going to be a lot of overlap. That being said, because you, the people, some people who make metals are not in that camp. You can have people who are doing much more modern cutting edge or even experimental things. And to some extent, this is part, not all, but part of the tension that existed in the US and the Mint in the late 19th century, early 20th century between the Mint staff, you know, the, the barbers especially, and uh, the outside sculptors like St. Gordon's, Weinman, and, and, the, and Fraser and the others. So that uh, one was conservative, but also a very technical uh, person. Coin people, people who design coins need to be very technical because of all the striking requirements, wear requirements, and so on. People making metals don't. You can do anything. You just need, in general, uh, somebody, some sort of patron or person who's willing to put up some money to support you. If you can find the person to buy it, uh, then you can keep on producing whatever you want. And that's the big difference. You know, finding the person who likes modern art is a lot easier than finding the government official who wants something experimental. Scott, Scott if I could jump in. Um, yes, please. Do, do, I'm, I'm on the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee and, you know, Peter, is a, uh, Peter Van Elfen is a colleague there uh, just recently joining us. And uh, I can tell you that um, the, the chief engraver, uh, Jomina of the, of the United States Mint is a sculptor and he does monumental work. Uh, yeah. He does, um, and he brings, uh, and he has brought, uh, he's carried on where Don Everhart, his predecessor left off, uh, bringing a sculptural eye to our coinage. And, uh, you know, and you should all know that you know, we're stuck with designs that are, you know, kind of done in Congress and, and yeah. it's the- it's And, the and that's the, the, the major problem. But it again, is. circulating coins have a much greater restriction than collectors commemoratives. Yeah, exactly. And, and but notwithstanding, when the design comes to us, um, they're viewed and discussed in the citizen, in, in, in our committee, uh, as we're, as handheld works of art, and mm -hmm. you see that with the platinum, um, you know, with with our our platinum series, um, where liberty is is um, you know where, where things are being depicted as flowers, and you saw that with the American Liberty coin design that every two years we issue, uh, which are much different. Mm -hmm. I would like to say much different than say the state quarters, which yes. were, you know. <laughs> But that's, you know, the lo a local committee said that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right. But, so but, the, but there's, yes, there there's is a there. trend, and and keep your eye out for for you know for U.S. coins that you know they shouldn't be dismissed as not artistic, and 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 that is the case in many mints in the world. Uh, by the way, and many of these committees of that advise on coin design are composed entirely by artists, as it is in Portugal, as it is in Lithuania, as it is in Latvia, and I could go on and on. Poland. I mean, I, I remember you mentioning. Uh... When Mashiko got the Soltis medal, was mm -hmm. it like no, no, uh, Fraser is dead or whatever? Right. Yeah, I mean, I would very much like to see, you know, coin, general coin with a more up to date design. Even though that's not my personal interest, this is you know, you know, here in the twenty first century, designs should not be a hundred years old. I, I, that, he's quoting one of my favorite sayings: "Adolf Wyman is dead. Get Adolf over Wyman. it." That, that was and, the first, yes. And um, you know, and that beautiful design, uh, that beautiful Saltus Award Medal that uh, Scott showed you, it is absolutely gorgeous. But what you have to know about that medal is that um, Adolf Wyman spent six months designing one medal. He got paid in 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 1918. He got paid ten thousand dollars to produce that medal. Right, that's not the marketplace today. Yeah. And you know, and 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 Adolf Wyman could no easier design a contemporary work of art than contemporary artists could try to do what Adolf Wyman was doing. And I wouldn't want them to do that. No, not at all. Again, you know, we 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 can all collect or study whatever we want, but the coins should reflect the times. My two cents. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, that brings us back to the top of the hour. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, your brilliance is always, of course, welcome uh, here at the American Numismatic Society. And I thank all of you uh, for joining us today on this long table. Um, and with that, uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.